left off, this slide showed a bilaminar embryonic disc. Now we want to kind of um, talk about something called gastrulation. <clears throat> That's a process where a bilaminar embryonic disc becomes a trilaminar embryonic disc. Three layers. We're going to look at some pictures here. Um, so here are the three layers endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. From these three germ layers, we're going to get the organogenesis of all the organ systems. And I give you kind of a prelude of what it's going to be, but I really don't go into that too much. I think it's enough just to know that they're there. There's three layers, and you, you, you get all the organ systems in those three primary germ layers. So what we see here, <clears throat> we were at day 12. Before the break, and this is day 14, 15, right before gastrulation. So we still have our two layers, our bilaminar embryonic disc and our two balloons. What we've seen is that uh, the extra embryonic mesoderm is fully proliferated all the way around. I guess that's the only thing that's kind of new. Extra embryonic mesoderm is fully proliferated. Around this time, if you follow the illustrator's schematics, you take your two balloons. Let's take an inventory of everything so we know what we're looking at here. You have cytotrophoblast. Okay. What do we call the little spaces? The lacuna? Yeah. And then that red layer. Cytotrophoblast. Okay, but we said trophoblast is extra embryonic. Then we've got the two balloons, amnion, the oak sac. That's also extra embryonic. What they do is they cut it in a way, right like this. So you got this <coughs> uh, bilaminar embryonic disc. Then, then they cut it this way. So you get a sectional view of the bilaminar embryonic disc. This way we can witness the migration of cells um, that happen during gastrulation. So, day 14, 15, you get extra amniotic mesoderm fully proliferated, but this is also occurring. So, I'm going to write this. Day 14, 15. Continue, but now talking about gastrulation. So, what you see in that picture is there's a migration of epiblast cells into what's called the primitive streak, which will eventually be the space for the, uh, the vertebra. But um, the main thing to note, you get this first migration of epiblast cells into the primitive streak. So what we see here is that um,
those cells become the endoderm. They're going to replace the cells down below there, form the endoderm. Cells become endoderm. So that, that's one of the um, layers of the trilaminar embryonic disc. And then about a day later, day 16, of gas relation, you simply have a second migration of epiblast cells. Into the street. And basically, well, those cells <clears throat> are sandwiched between layers top and bottom. They become mesoderm cells. The cells that did not migrate and that remain behind become the ectoderm cells. So the second migration cells, these cells, become the mesoderm. Remaining cells, remaining epiblast cells, are now the ectoderm. Okay, so, so that's all of them. That's the ectoderm, mesoderm. Okay, so that's the other two. If that's how it forms in those couple of days, this is, um, you know, 16 days post-fertilization. Here's the other pictures of the trilaminar embryonic disc forming. You can see how it's clearly labeled there and in there. And at this point, we can start to talk about, you know, what we have been talking about. But as a summary, the four main extraembryonic membranes that help development, the amniotic sac, Allotois and the chorion. Okay. Well, here's a picture that shows some of these things. Extrionic uh, membranes. Now we've been saying the amnion all along. So far, first couple of weeks post fertilization, it just looks like this balloon, okay? And uh, but eventually, it'll completely envelop the fetus, the embryo, and it provides uh, a, a water-filled environment. It's just a trilaminar embryonic disc. The yolk sac <clears throat> that's for the genesis of blood cells and blood vessels. There's a little evagination, a little pocketing 
and outpocketing of the yolk sac. That's called the allantois. <clears throat> Evagination of yolk sac. Okay, well that little part, um, it'll help form the urinary bladder. It also helps part of the umbilical stock. Forms urinary bladder. Stock. On the figure, they call it connecting stock. You know, same difference. It, it connects. Let's see, what else was there? I did them all. I didn't do chorion yet. Now, the chorion, we're going to look at it the most extensively because that is the embryo portion of the placenta. Chorion. I'll just put it in parentheses. That, that's the maternal part. Okay, those are the two parts. That's placenta. All right, let me move on from this picture. Okay, now we've got a side by side. Um, it's good to look at things side by side so you can make comparisons in your head and process the information. Going back to about seven days, seven and a half days. Well, on these first two things, seven and a half, 12 days, do you see bilaminar or trilaminar embryonic disc? First two days. It's the bilaminar. And, and I see our amnion forming, our yolk sac, okay. Um, by the time you get to 12 days, it's still bilaminar, but I'm starting to see that extra embryonic mesoderm. I start to see our syncytiotrophoblast, and they, they dig deep enough to nick a maternal artery. So you can fill the spaces with maternal blood, as shown here, go to 16 days. Let's, re let's remember 14, 15, 16, that's when you have the gastrulation. So now it's trilaminar with our little evagination, our allantois, our two, uh, our two balloons, so to speak. Now we're completely bathed in maternal blood. So this has a chance to continue, okay, because you, you, you have the nourishment now. Um, we have a model that's uh, about 15 days. It's still bilaminar, and you still have the lacuna illustrated there. Um, okay, another thing to note, that proliferating extra embryonic mesoderm, you can see why it's extra embryonic. You have mesoderm that's part of the disc, so that is not extra embryonic, that's embryonic. But all the extra pro proliferating extra embryonic mesoderm that's helping to form chorion right there. See how they put a loop around that? Okay, well, let me know what you're supposed to know about that. So let's continue our notes with chorion. So we just noted that, right? The placenta is those two things, <coughs> chorion and the decidua. All right, so we're about 16 plus days post-fertilization. So fertilization happened on ovulation day 14. 14 plus 16 is 30. When you get to the 30th day, maybe the woman's like, I'm two days late. Okay, maybe you start to think about it. So at this time, you start to get HCG. Let's remember what I had said previously. Um, part of what, what I want you to know is that HCG is 
well, it targets the corpus luteum, keeps it alive, it's replacing LH. Because the hormone levels, sex hormones are so high, you're turning off the gonadotropin. So this is the gonadotropin that maintains the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum of a normal pregnancy is a couple of weeks, but the corpus luteum of pregnancy is, is about three to four months. So you can see the HCG, HCG levels rise at about week two post-fertilization, right? And, uh, you know, I got to draw an arrow there. Keep that alive until placental hormones can kick in, okay? All right. So that's the goal here. So again, just going back to 13. Okay, remember, you go from 13 to 21. So 13 is before gastrulation, okay? But the reason why I put this in there is look at the chorion. You see how, like, little things are starting to bud out, these little finger-like things. Compare that from 13 to 21, where these finger-like projections of the chorion, now we call the chorion, chorionic villi when it fully develops. Because now the chorion will contain blood vessels, and can, can you tell who those belong to, mom or baby? Follow back. The baby. Okay, so here's the yolk sac, the genesis of blood cells, and it's sending embryonic blood vessels out to the chorion, and it's pushing its way into the chorion. For example, there's mom's blood. There's mom's blood right there. There's baby's blood. And so the, the point of the placenta is for that to intermix. All right, so let's really get to the nitty gritty of what a chorion is and kind of have a highlight here. Well, let's call it chorionic villi because that describes the shape. Villi means finger shape. Okay? <clears throat> and it's three layers. It's cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, and it's extra embryonic mesoderm. Those three things. That's the choreo. Cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, mesoderm. Well, it's extra embryonic mesoderm. Okay, it's not the mesoderm, that's the trilaminar disc. Extra. Okay, so the important thing about that, that membrane, it's actually three membranes, I guess, is that it contains embryonic blood vessels. Okay. So it's got these three layers of cells, but also I'll add contains embryonic blood vessels. So what you can see is that what crosses the placenta has to cross these three layers there. Okay, So th there's the space with maternal blood, lacuna. And you got the blood vessels there for the baby. Here's a picture of a full picture, not a zoomed in picture. But you see the chorionic villi. At, see, now we're skipping. Now we're at four and a half weeks, right? That's about a month and a half, I guess. A uh, little over a month. <clears throat> and you see chorionic villi completely uh, surround embryo. So at this point, always be aware <clears throat> when you see something, does it belong to blood? Does the blood belong to, or blood vessel belong to mom or baby? So let me point to this. Mom or baby? Mom. What about the ones in here? These are the ones that belong to baby. So all these finger-like extensions are the chorionic villi. That's the placenta. 
Okay, and you can see how blood is draining in, and then you can have an exchange with the baby there. Um, so here's, um, I rotated that a little bit. Here's the model we have in the room that's about a month. If you had to identify the white membrane, what do you think you're going for there? It's the blue on the other picture. Amio. Okay, so there's an embryo inside there. You can see the yolk sac or the umbilical stock. And you can see how, well, these blood vessels, mom or baby. Okay, baby, and what about these? Still baby. The ones that belong to mom, boom, 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 all those, right? So you could call this endometrium, or really you should call it the decidua. Uh, the decidua basalis on this side. And on this side, uh, capsularis, okay? <clears throat> So if I point to this, <clears throat> I'm going for either, if you put chorionic villi or embryonic blood vessels, you're gonna get it right. I mean, it's kind of hard to point to something like this and not distinguish between the two. So I do have a little wiggle room when I grade lab practicals, all right? Uh, what would you call this? Yeah, if you called it maternal blood, that would be cool. If you called it lacuna with maternal blood, that would be cool. Or just lacuna, I'd probably accept too. I'd be most impressed with lacuna filled with maternal blood. Now, what I like about this model that this picture doesn't show, they show the gas exchange. Can you see it? You go from red to blue, and you drain that blue out. Okay? So you have gas exchange. Okay, that's all. Any questions on that? Yeah? Are those capillaries? Uh, these are considered arteries. Yeah. So the gas right there? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Capillary? Okay. Yeah. There is some um, a capillary exchange. Okay. I was pointing here. Yes. Capillaries where you have gas exchange. That is correct. <clears throat> we all, oh, look at this. We got, okay. Now we go from four and a half to 13 <laughs> weeks. And what are the changes? I'm going to focus on the setting here. Week fetus. Notice how the chorionic villi on the capsularis side, they kind of all got flattened. So if you follow the chorion um, on this picture, <clears throat> I don't know how you, you got the blood vessels, you got know that brownish color of the chorionic villi. If you follow that brownish color, watch where I'm pointing, do you see how like it turns in just to like a flat layer? There's no chorionic villi on this side, okay? So on this side, um, they call it now chorion levé on the decidua capsularis side. So on this, no, on decidua basalis side. First, let's go with that side first. This is the important side, because that's mom's part of the placenta. But on that side, <clears throat> let me point to it, which is the, the same side as the umbilical cord, you have chorionic villi. The chorion, they're finger-like, and they got the maternal blood vessels in there. I'm, I'm sorry, they got the embryonic blood vessels in there. I don't want to misspeak. point of that term is that it, it's flattened out. It's non-villous. There's 
no finger-like things with the embryonic blood vessels inside. Okay, it's non-villous. Along with it, you have decidua capsularis, and um, the amnion. Okay. So think of decidua capsularis as a layer, the corion levae as a layer, and then the amnion as a third layer. And so those are the three things that ruptures when <coughs> the water breaks. One, two, three, rupture. Well, that, that term, you know, water breaks. <coughs> So hopefully that doesn't happen until you know week week four. This is week thirteen. But um, this this is a good figure to notice the three deciduous. Color in some of them. Decidua that's overlying the baby there. Yeah, this is decidua capsularis, what I'm calling it. This would be decidua of the salus. It's on the same side as the umbilical cord, basically. Okay, I, I can't color up there, obviously, but decidua of the salus. What about this part that's lining the rest of the uterine cavity? Decidua uh, parietalis. Okay, that's a rough color, just to give you an idea. Decidua parietalis. Remember, that's the one that lines the uterine cavity, which is obviously now filled with baby. The uterine cavity has been reduced to a little sliver right there. The rupture can happen naturally, or um, to induce labor, a physician can do it with finger or blood instrument. <coughs> that will be painful, because when you do that, it's going to induce contractions. Let's talk about the physiology of the placenta. So on this figure here, what they do, they kind of like take that, zoom in it, okay? And let's keep track of the embryonic and maternal blood vessels there. thing I have, um, well, the toughest thing that students um, have trouble with is identifying decidua basalis on this figure. Do you see it? Right there. That's the part that falls off. Stratum basalis. That doesn't fall off. That remains. It's the endometrium or the decidua that falls off. Okay. Um, now every year, I get a little better at teaching this, but students still don't get much better at identifying it. Uh, I don't know why. I'm not trying to. Why well, I'm calling you out? I, I'm tired of you guys missing it. <laughs> so. It's, it's this part here. All that part there. Try 
better call her something in here. All this meat right here is decidua basalis. It's the part that's going to fall off. Sometimes I'd ask it on the lecture exam. Sometimes I'd ask it on the live practical. Sometimes I ask it on both. It's like you miss it on one, I give you a second chance to get it right. Some, some of you guys are usually 0 for 2 on it. So um, try to get that one. Okay. Decidua basalis. Uh, so let's teach this by just talking about maternal blood vessels, arteries and veins, um, I guess fetal or embryonic blood vessels, arteries and veins, those four things. Let's start with what I think is easiest to understand, the maternal <coughs> arteries. I'll use red, as they call it in red there. Okay, these are delivering nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich blood to the lacuna, oh, eventually to the baby. Okay, let's think of it that way in terms of the baby. Bring O2 rich nutrient rich blood to baby. And they do have the white arrows that show the direction of blood flow. You, know, you deliver it to the lacunar space. Now the maternal veins, it looks like they're taking away blood. Okay. So arteries always deliver blood. Veins always drain it and take it away and return blood to the heart so it can recirculate. So in this case, um, the maternal veins, they take um, oxygen-poor, nutrient-poor blood away from the baby. Right? The baby needs mom to do that. Maternal veins. So blue denotes deoxygenated blood. So take O2 poor nutrient poor blood away. Okay, instead of taking it to baby, take it away from baby. Think of it that way. That's what mom is for. Well, now, now look at the embryonic blood vessels inside the chorionic villi. So I guess you could have arteries and veins for that too. I want to use the word embryo and not fetal since I spend most of the time talking about the embryonic development today. Um, so the embryonic Let's see. Okay, then, okay. So if I use the term embryonic or fetal, it talks about the blood vessels in the chorionic villi. If you talk about the arteries or veins in the umbilical cord, you would call it umbilical artery or, or vein. So it just depends on where you talk about it. Maybe it's good to focus on right here because you know in the umbilical cord, it's going to and from baby. So maybe that'll make it more clear. And let's look at this. You have um, two umbilical arteries. It's hard to see in the back, I'll point them out. There's two. They're arteries, they're taking blood out to here, and they're blue, and they're arteries. And that always confuses students because fetal circulation is reversed. So let me get that on the, on the board here. You have two. umbilical arteries. In the adult circulation, arteries have the oxygenated blood because it just came from the lungs, but not in baby. As a matter of fact, baby's not even breathing, right? Baby's in a water-filled environment, so there's no oxygen in the arteries there. So you pump out, you pump away that blood. Um, I think of it this way, the two umbilical arteries <coughs> Take 
O2 poor, nutrient poor, blood away. So I'm writing the exact same thing as maternal veins as for umbilical arteries, because they both do that. So, baby has waste products accumulating. It uses the arterial system to pump that blood away from baby. It takes it out to the placenta, where you can have um, exchange with the lacuna. Then mom will take that spent blood and take it away further. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about there. So, but now let's talk about how the maternal arteries, how that blood is brought to baby. So that's the one umbilical vein. Veins always return blood. So in this case, the one umbilical vein, it has all the goods from mom. One umbilical vein. Take O2 rich, nutrient rich, blood to me. That one vein, that's your lifeline. It's one vein. I wish it were like a hundred. It's just, it's just one. You kink that and that's it. It's the one lifeline. Okay, so always remember two umbilical um, arteries and one umbilical vein. And the, the, the red and the blue here match the function. Okay, blue means what? It means um, away and also means oxygen. What about oxygen rich or oxygen poor? Blue usually means oxygen poor. Red usually means oxygen rich. You know, some model makers, they, they, they ignore that. They just always want to make arteries red and veins blue. Okay, so if you see that, don't be fooled. Okay, here it's presented because, yeah, your author likes to present it in terms of blue is deoxygenated, red is oxygenated. But know, know that you, you may see a model that colors these red and that blue. But we'll, hopefully you can remember what we taught in the lecture today. Any questions on the placenta? Yeah? So which one is correct? Like, is there a changeover where that blue turns to red in the baby, where it is the artery in the vein? Or where are they actually supposed to be colored? Well, you see the gas exchange. It becomes oxygenated as you go from blue to purple to red. That's where the change actually happens. On the edge of the chorionic villi is here. Okay. Then that, see how it, it drains back red there? Okay, and into the one. Does that answer your question? No, like, so in the baby, like right now, it's showing that the baby is going to have blue arteries and a red vein. That's right. So when do they switch? I'll teach uh, full on fetal circulation after I teach cardio. Okay. Okay, so we will see that later. But for now, let's just kind of like. For now, let's just kind of um, get this one figured out, right? But, but you're right. Fetal circulation is quite different. But I don't like to teach that until I teach heart and then blood vessels. Then I'll go back to fetal. Of course, any student is, you can look it up. <laughs> Anyone can. If you want to take a sneak peek. That can't hurt you either. What did I color it again? Decision for salad. Uh, semester one student was like she missed it and she like yeah I remember you coloring and uh, so yeah as the days pass you guys forget this stuff so it's, it's good to review every day you won't forget you won't miss the sigil of the salus I guess I better ask it 
Okay, All right, well, let's get to um, labor and delivery. Uh, I've reduced 40 weeks down to just these couple hours here. And, well, when the contractions begin, they're very painful. The, the begin near the top of the year is about the fundus, and it's sweeping away inferiorly towards the cervix. And they're strong, uh, regular intervals. Hopefully, the, the fetus will change down head first towards the cervical canal. I remember this is what they told me when I had my uh, first daughter. Uh, I got three kids now, but my first kid I remember uh, vividly. 511. Contractions are five minutes apart. <clears throat> Each contraction is about a minute in duration. This happens for about an hour, and you can kind of roughly time that. And you, you might be ready to go to the hospital at that point. And uh, well, they'll do a cervical exam. And they'll assess whether, yeah, this is it, or they'll just get back home, and, which will be very disconcerting. Like you're writhing in pain and they're sending you back home. Are you kidding me? But uh, it depends. It's the nurse's call, it's the doctor's call. And so let's talk about a cervical exam. Um, okay, let me just list things I want you to know here. Now, why a cervical exam? Well, you can palpate, feel things there, okay? Well, one of the things in a cervical exam is dilation. That cervical canal has to dilate to about uh, 10 centimeters to accommodate baby's head. Cervical dilatation. Goal, 10 centimeters. That's the goal, okay? That will be fully dilated. And you know, the, the nurse can, can check. Maybe if you're not dilated enough, they'll send you home. Okay, maybe if you're dilated enough, okay, you, you can stay. You know, they'll admit you to the hospital. The other the thing they check is called um, a face name. Effacement is a thinning out of the cervical wall. Right here. See how thick it is there? A couple few centimeters. But as it starts to thin out, you can, you can feel that. The examiner, the doctor, they can feel it thin out. Okay. So um, when you're not pregnant, it's about you know a few centimeters. But with labor, as baby head pushes down, it thins the cervix out. Uh, you report it as a percentage, right? So the goal is 90% effaced. Ninety percent thinned out. Okay, that'll be 100% right there. The other thing they can um, monitor is the position of baby's head. That's called um, station. to a landmark, an anatomical landmark. Uh, that would be the, uh, the spines, or the ischial spines. Uh, you can palpate them in the pelvis, I've been told. Let's remember, uh, when you learn the pelvis, those spines, those are the narrowest part, side to side, in the pelvis. Um, well, the model kind of shows you. Well, that's a picture of a model. Let me hit this link to give you a better understanding before I give you the, uh, how they report it there. Let's see if this link still works. Come on, YouTube. All right, hold on a second. I'll queue it up.
There's no sound. I just so you can see it. So baby head is coming down. There are the spines, that level. So when you're at minus three, you're still in the pelvis. And as baby heads come down, they report. There's minus two, minus one. Zero is kind of when you're at the level. And then as baby head goes past that, um, you get down to you get down to like plus three. You're essentially delivered. So I've been told. Okay. So that, that's it right there. Baby head relative to an anatomical landmark. All right, so you report in centimeters. The goal is like zero plus one plus two station. Usually, um, in a clinical setting, the obstetrician would just shout out numbers and not use any units in this order. 4, 80, minus 2 would mean 4 centimeters dilated, 80% of face, minus 2 station. 10, 100, plus 3 would mean 10 centimeters dilated, 100% of face, plus 3 station. Something I didn't mention previously about you know the, the pains of uh, childbirth is epidural. Uh, anatomically, I like to mention that well the epidural space provides the space where the um, anesthetics can circulate, and you won't feel the uterine contractions. They do monitor it, monitor it, and you can see the, the waves on the myogram there. The mom can just sleep right through it, just to increase the comfort there. Not all hospitals offer it, uh, but if the catheters placed correctly to make things more comfortable. So here's a summary of everything I was talking about. Here they have early dilation, late dilation, and what happens if you never dilate? Well, the doctor may say, okay, let's have a C-section. Now I'm not gonna teach that, you can look it up, but instead of being delivered through the birth canal, you make an incision in the abdominal wall, usually the bikini line, and you just go through the abdominal wall, you go through the uterine wall, and then just deliver through the uterine wall. Okay, and all, all three of my kids were delivered that way because the first kid was. And usually they say, well, if the first kid was C-section, your other ones have to be. Because if I make an incision in the uterine wall, you probably want to do it that way every time because it's been weakened by having to cut it open the first time. Okay. Um, yeah, and so baby's delivered. And then what is this falling off? What's the placenta? What do we call it today? Decidua facellus. Yeah, a lot of bleeding. Mom uses a lot of blood. They usually prescribe uh, iron supplements to help recoup the lost blood during labor and delivery. If it was C-section, the only difference is you have a long, that's major surgery. <coughs> that the recovery time is maybe weeks instead of days. Okay. All right, so that's the end of development. Uh, let's talk about uh, what we got for the rest of the week. That concludes the material for your unit exams. Le lecture exam two, lab practical one, which are next week. So, but let's talk about what we have for the rest of the week. Maybe I could get ahead. No, I don't need to get ahead. I want to start hard, but I could wait for that. 
I just want to give you the rest of the week to study. Um, so, let's see. 7, 30, uh, 10, 50. Uh, you can just study the whole time, okay, on Wednesday. I won't lecture. I thought about lecturing, but I'll just cram it in some other time. Remember I said that, because when I cram it in some other time, you're not going to like it. Okay. I had a chance to get ahead, but I said, I'm going to let you study, because I think you guys are feeling the stress. So I'll take a little bit of the edge off by just giving you a full day that day. And this day, too, except this day, I got to cut class early. I got a meeting. I can't miss it. Um, anyways, I could go from 7.30 to like 9.50, uh, so I can get to my meeting on time. But anyways, next couple of days, I won't lay anything new on you. You breathe a little bit. Uh, ace your exams next week. Any questions for me?